Hey, everybody. So before we get started, uh, we just wanted to pay a quick tribute to someone that we lost this week. Uh, our friend Nathan passed, uh, and we just wanted to dedicate this episode to him. Nathan was probably one of the sweetest men you could ever hope to meet, uh, even in ridiculously competitive macho situations he managed to be what we would call our moral guide point uh he always brought a sense of goodness and chill wherever he went uh he was smart funny i'm gonna say obnoxiously good looking (laughs) just (laughs) aggressively handsome so much you almost didn't want to be friends with him in addition to that he loved this show he always wanted to talk about it he showed up at our live shows i appreciate all of our listeners of course but like having nathan's endorsement in particular meant a lot to me because he always felt like he should be a little bit too cool to be listening to our show yeah from day one of this silly little project of ours he gave us a hundred times the support and love we could ever hope to deserve and we probably wouldn't be doing this without him in a lot of ways. He really seemed to understand what we were doing here and appreciated it and encouraged it. He was a human being of just unbridled enthusiasm and empathy, and every second he was in your life was just a little bit warmer and more exciting. Uh, he spent his life generating just the most incredible stories and memories you will ever hear, and... And I'm going to cherish the ones that he gave me for the rest of my life. We'll miss you, big guy. Just is that, or was there anything else you wanted to put No, down? I think that's it. Uh, one thing I did write about Nathan is that, like, he always brought an air to, every t- to everything. Like, just before you were hanging out with him, he was having very generous sex with a yoga instructor on a houseboat full of weed. Uh, yeah. But I don't yeah, think I- I'm going to put that in there. I mean, the, something uh, something I was like thinking about putting uh, about Nathan was he and I started a detective agency <laughs> one time because Nate because we were bullshitting about it at a bar and I was like, oh yeah, sure, let's do it, thinking that like at most we would be finding an old lady's cat six months from now, and then a week and a half later I was staked out in a casino investigating adultery, like. <laughs> That was just the kind of fucking person that Nate was. I, he st- always he seemed too cool to hang with us. Uh, yeah, and like almost intimidatingly so. And but when you talk to him, anytime I invited Nathan somewhere and he showed up, I got hype. I was like, yes! yeah, 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 yeah. I got the good one. <laughs> you know exactly. Yeah, you when you got a Nathan night. It was, you know, you knew that, like, one way or another, it was going to be, like, the highlight of your month. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were going to get some kind of a story out of it, and either he was going to tell you something insane, or you were going to go on an incredible night with him. It was weird. He could simultaneously, like, be the smartest person in the room, and also encourage you to do the dumbest things, because it was so yeah. funny. Like exactly, that was that was his whole uh, his whole vibe. Uh, yeah, no, he he is a human being that has inspired the most intense feelings of jealousy in me, <laughs> just by virtue of like talking for ten minutes. I, I remember, like, on, regularly, you would just like yell, "We get it, you're tall and good looking. Shut up!" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Breaking oh, Mayberry, man. everyone. <laughs> I'm a fucking miss him. Hello and welcome to another episode of Breaking Mayberry, the show that wishes you good times and delightful days. I'm one of your hosts, Marty Schneider. I'm the other host, Dan Ludwig. That was oddly wholesome. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm in a wholesome mood right now. Y- uh, yeah. we're, we're talking about a wholesome family show, of course, and m- mocking it mercilessly. 
Breaking Mayberry, a show that wants you to live life and laugh with your family on a porch. Breaking Mayberry, live moss. <laughs> Breaking Mayberry, hug your golden retriever. <laughs> Breaking Mayberry, go watch a movie about a golden retriever that's voiced by, like, Dennis Quaid or some shit. Uh, and this, for some reason dies, like, halfway through the movie, but people like it. But I, then comes back, yeah. Breaking Mayberry. Yeah. Those kind of movies. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> I'm one of your hosts, I'm Marty Schneider. We already did that. <laughs> I'm the other host, I'm Dan Ludwig. Dan, I gotta tell you about something that ha- I witnessed today. I-, I was driving out in the suburbs. I went to the suburbs to go pick something up, uh, and I was driving back on one of those, like, multi-lane highways that have like strip malls and car dealerships and stuff on auto sides you know the suburbs uh Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden like two guys two dudes in their like early 20s run out into the street in front of me and i stop for them and i give them plenty of room and they just start grabbing stuff off the street one of them's in like a yellow jacket like he just came off Mm -hmm. a construction shift the other one's got a diner uh like wait staff uniform on and they are just hauling ass through this hallway just grabbing stuff off of the ground and they're directly in front of me right so i'm the one that mm-hmm. stopped to give them and i go well, what the hell are these guys doing and i roll up my window and i look out uh and they are grabbing handfuls of money off of the street 20s 50s probably a couple of hundreds in there and one dude, the bigger one of them, like, like lifts up his hand, and it just looks like wrapping paper on Christmas morning. Just a handful of dollar of dollars. And did you yield for a bank robbery? I don't. I he, one of them went to the car next to me and was like trying to get him to pull forward because there was a twenty under his left tire. And I, I stuck my head out of the window and I made a little joke and I was like, haha, you guys, you're going to give me some of that money for stopping, right? One of them just threw this $20 bill in my, in my window and was just like, here, man, we just found this. And as I pulled away, cause the light turned green, they were on the sidewalk counting their cash. And I was like, that's amazing. That's good for those guys. I'm so happy for them. And I got about two blocks away and I was like, those guys are going to get murdered. Marty, that's evidence that you have. <laughs> I just saw the beginning of a Steven Soderbergh film. You can't, we can't do this, put this in the podcast. Because that bill is like marked by the FB fucking eye. Yeah, I should probably get rid of this. You should immediately get rid of this because a gangster played by Christopher Walken is going to fucking come into your house and stab you. I, I think like, I'm good on $20. I think just no! having the 20 is, is... Oh, I'm sorry. Do you know how the mafia works? Do you know that they're very forgiving with every little cent of money? Do you do you, do they not kill people just to send a message, hmm. Marty? Good point. Good point. You're uh, going to get murdered. I mean, sure. But here's like, the thing, he, right? The gangster is going to be like, there's people out here podcasting about taking our money. We can't accept this. We got to send a message. Here's the thing, though, right? Give him if- a Colombian necktie, even though we're Italian. If he's coming to me and he's like, where's the fucking money? And he starts hitting me. I can give him back $20. Like, I generally can pay that with interest. You know? Uh, yeah. I'm not, not super concerned about that. Super concerned about those guys, though. There's, <laughs> there is a point, right? Like, finding money on the street is lucky up until a certain dollar amount. And I don't know what that dollar amount is. But once you hit a certain dollar amount, it becomes incredibly unlucky to find money on the street. I think anything over a hundred dollars is fucking unlucky because then it's like, fuck, I gotta like find who dropped. Actually, you know, what? I'm gonna say anything over two hundred two hundred dollars is unlucky. Two hundred, yeah, because that's when you have to be like, fuck, I gotta find who dropped this. I need to hold this money and stand here for like twenty fucking minutes in case the person that dropped it uh, comes back. Or, like, take it to the store I'm at and say, I think someone lost this $200. Otherwise, you're a bad person. It also depends on the, like, style of this money. Like, how it is placed. Like, to be clear, this was just, like, free fall. Like, literally looked like it had fallen off the back of a truck. If it had been in, say, a duffel bag, just back away. Just back They were the just holding, away. like, bushels of just money? bushels of money. I told you, it looked like wrapping paper. I think they robbed somebody. I think they robbed a bank because they like they weren't going to be like here, man, take a twenty. We just we just like knocked up a Seven Eleven. 
Like, have some, have some spoils. Of course, they're going to be like, hey, man, we found, we got this through innocent legal means. You have a great day. (laughs) You know what's weird? This is not the first time in my life I've witnessed something like this. What was the other one? (laughs) The other time in my life, I was probably 18 or 19 years old. uh, And I was waiting to cross the street as a pedestrian. And a car pulled up. And two people were arguing inside of the car. And one of the person in the passenger seat yelled, I'm so sick of this. And threw out what appeared to be a ton of $20 bills just out onto the street and mm-hmm. drove away. And me, of course, at age 18 or 19, was just like, what the fuck just happened? I'm going to go grab these. And I got really excited for this. And they were all those fake bills that actually you open them up and they're like, the real treasure is in heaven. Like, oh, those. Come to. Like, you can't take it with you. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. And I'm just like, this is, if you left this on the sidewalk, you are guaranteed to go to hell. Like. Yeah. That's uh, the meanest thing you can do is like, someone's going to walk past me like, we can pay rent this month. Oh, fuck you, Jesus. But, you son of a bitch. But yeah, so I got to spend this real fucking fast. Uh, yeah, again, a gangster played by Christopher Walken is going to, like, I, honestly, I would get, I would just throw that out your window because he could come in during the recording of this podcast. So, yeah, so that's something I saw today. I saw the, I saw the end of two boys' lives. Uh, how old were they? I'm going to say early 20s, like 22, 24. Were they in suits? No, no. I, okay, they didn't rob a bank. I, I, a I, t- I told you, like, they looked like they just got off their work shift. Like, these were working stiffs. One of them was a diner waiter. The other was a construction worker. I've seen No Country for Old Men. I know this doesn't end well for them. This is going to make such a great late 90s Edward Norton vehicle. Oh, we are like, we are about to become a true crime podcast. Yeah, we are. Get in on that sweet, sweet true crime money. I might die. <laughs> you might fucking die. And then I'll do, I'll continue the podcast, but I'll be like, we're still breaking Mayberry, but this is now me solving Marty's murder. <laughs> anyway, here's my take on forensic evidence. Do, 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 do. It would be great if it, you still do the Andy Griffiths theme, actually. But, <laughs> but, but, but haunting but, but, now. But, but in serial do, format. Do, do, do. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, let, let's get into an actual breaking, uh, actual episode of television. I think what we really need after a long, stressful week is just a nice, leisurely, no rage-inducing Andy Griffith show episode. Do we have one of those queued up? Just like not whatsoever. Nice? Oh, cool! None whatsoever. Awesome. What we actually have today is season three, episode twenty-eight, "The Rivals." Originally airs April eighth, nineteen sixty-three. Written by Harvey Bullock and directed by. He was a sergeant in the Marines, but was dishonorably discharged for slapping his privates, Bob Sweeney. Special thanks to listener John Fulcher for putting that on our Facebook page. Now you all know me. I'm Bob Sweeney. I've lived in this town my entire life. Ulysses Sweeney helped build this town. And it's my humble opinion that rock and roll should never be allowed in the town of Shippensburg. Bob Sweeney. And here is your one sentence summary from Wikipedia. Opie has a crush on his schoolmate Karen. So Barney tries to teach Opie about women. But Opie ends up Dating Thelma Lou. So this episode, man, uh, this episode gives us some key insights, uh, much needed insights into the relationship uh, of Barney and Thelma Lou. Um, It's bad. It's not a good one. Open up the file. Inside it just says, bad. Close the file. You're done. We solved the mystery. Uh, Also, are we like legally obligated to make a Karen joke? Over the course of this episode, no, should we just like get care. one of it's, those it's a, out of the way? It's a little girl, dude. Like, and then although she, she called the cops on a black guy at the park. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, like well, that. actually, I, she's she's a little girl in the 1960s, but she's probably old enough to be a straight up Karen. Karen today, but eh, oh, yeah. I'm not going to do that. Whatever. This, yeah. Right now, let's let's imagine her as a little girl. By the way, I think the first little girl we've heard speak on this show and she's an asshole no she's a total Uh, dick it rules but that's ridiculous like we see little boys terrorize this town entirely do you remember a little girl as a character at all 
Opie had a girlfriend for like one episode in season one, but she didn't say anything. She was purely hypothetical. She did did not make an on camera appearance. No, she, she to the did. Best she of, did. She showed she up did. like at the at the end of one episode. I mean, it's probably why Opie is so like hard up on Karen, even though she's really mean to him. She's one of the only girls in town. They all get sent out to the cornfield, except a select few that are deemed cute enough. It's so weird. So weird they went three years without having a little girl on... It's it's like it's like Harvey Bullock had a daughter between seasons two and three and was like, Oh yes, girl children exist! <laughs> I mean, this is the show that did an episode about childbirth and never showed the mom. <laughs> That's true! Uh, <laughs> it was an episode like, about childbirth with... Zero women involved. Yes, an all-male episode about what it's like to give birth to a child. So, like, I you, I don't understand how you're shocked by that. Uh, uh, so so this is a piss-soaked nightmare of an episode. It has so many layers of being awful that they didn't even occur to us. Like, yeah. we, th- we got distracted by one layer of awful, and, uh... Friend of the show, Marta, pointed out a layer of terribleness that we completely missed. Yeah, I mean, Marta, I know you're going to listen to this later. I completely pretended like I knew what you were talking about. Uh, and then I had to go back and rewatch it to catch it. I was going to mention this later on when we actually got to that episode. But uh, the other thing we need to mention is this is the episode where Barney goes full MRA. Like, <gasps> Oh, my God. Yeah, so he hard. gets he gets Reddit comment section real fucking fast. This is, like, honestly, a peek into a completely deranged mind. <laughs> but it was, what's really weird to me is it starts off pretty wholesome and pretty strong. Let's let's get into it. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Uh, we open up with Opie walking down the street with this little girl, Karen. She's cute. Whatever. Little, cute little girl. Uh, basically being dismissive of everything that he says. He's trying to impress her. He comes up with just, like, some very banal shit of, like, Hey, Karen, how was school today? Do you want to walk with me? And she's like, No. Uh, and then he's like, like, do you want to see the inside of a jail? At this point, she doesn't flat out reject him. She just doesn't seem to care very much one way or another that he's there. And yeah. he keeps, he keeps saying stuff like to make him sound more grown up. Uh, he says that Floyd gave him a haircut the other day and said that any day now I'm going to start shaving, you know, trying to make himself seem older. And Karen's just like, that's nice. Yeah. That's just- not a thing that really interests anybody but cool go for it man but he does score a a win when he's like hey have you ever seen the inside of a real life jail like we're not supposed to go in there but i bet i could work it out with my daddy um (laughs) yeah it's like and he receives like the most mild of interest to her she's like this is better than nothing so sure i'll get to say that i did something vaguely interesting today take your shot yeah, uh, and he does. He shoots his shot. They walk into the jail. Uh, Andy's just like, uh-huh, a girl, huh? Uh, and then Opie begins to give her the tour. And I will say, this is one of the rare times when watching these all in a row actually pays off. Because this gag is funnier. Because yeah. Opie is doing word for word the tour that Barney does when he wants to impress people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you step right over here, this is where we put our most desperate criminals. Just like Barney does, tries to get Andy to talk about how dangerous and exciting the job is. Uh, and Andy doesn't do it at first, but then plays into it. Stuff that is cute when it is done by a child and yeah. annoying when done by a grown man. Um, I, it's weird that Opie keeps emphasizing the desperation of the criminals. <laughs> like, Barney is always like, here's where uh, where we keep our most hard, evil monsters. And Opie's like, here's where we keep the people that just want food. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, very weird word choice from this small child. But whatever. But yeah, it is it is absolutely a, uh, a Barney Fife style uh, tour. Um, which I, it's, I think that's a nice touch, right? Yeah. He's doing he, the thing that he's seen Barney do. He accidentally mentions that he just comes in to take out the trash. Like, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, pe- like, just in- initiates flop sweat, and then she's just like, thanks for showing me the jail, Sheriff Taylor. I'm going to peace. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a good bit where 
Uh, Opie's like, cool, so uh, can I carry your books home? Signifying that it's the 1960s and we are girlfriend and boyfriend childs. Uh, and she's like, no, nope, my books aren't heavy. Bye. <laughs> Fuck Which, you, Opie. Fucking owned. <laughs> yeah. She stood up to, like, she can handle her own shit. This is just on feminist grounds, maybe, but probably not. Just devastating. She's just, just like, no, bye. Yeah, fuck off. It was, this was such a weird ritual for establishing, like, romantic intent. Like, can I carry objects for you? It's just like, yes, we're going steady. It's a very weird signifier of affection. <laughs> Not like, can I hold your fucking hand? Back at home that night, uh, Andy is reading the newspaper while Opie's, like, just hanging out. I want uh, for, the first time I watched it, I was like, oh, Opie's playing with like a toy or whatever. He's just playing with his shoe. Yeah, he's just holding his shoe, tying and untying it. This entire conversation, very strange. So Opie kind of starts asking about girls. He asks Andy, you know, when you like someone a whole lot, that means you love them, huh? And to which Andy should probably respond as a parent by being like, oh, time to put my game face on, really earn my money as a parent. And he's just like, yeah, maybe. Like <laughs> He does not look up from his newspaper. <laughs> he doesn't. And, yeah, Ubi is like, when I think about Karen, my knees shake and my stomach quivers and I get real sweaty. Is that love? And he's like, yeah, either that or you have the measles. Still not looking up from his newspaper. Like, your child is dis- is developing his fundamental understanding of what romantic affection is. And you're severely half-assing this. Opie is, for the first time, opening up about a significant development in his behavior and the way he's going to be as a person. And Andy's just sitting there like, boy, those Lockhorns really don't like each other. (laughs) Oh, Marmaduke, is there anything you won't do? (laughs) Oh, yeah, 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 no, totally. If if you feel a physical attraction to a person, you have to marry them. Totally, totally. (laughs) Finally, finally. Finally, Opie starts asking about getting married, and that's when Andy's like, guess I'm not going to find out what Judge Parker's up to. (laughs) (laughs) And puts his newspaper down, and uh, Opie asks something like, if if Karen and I get married, her name's going to be Taylor. And Andy's, this is actually, like, we're making fun of it. This is actually not a bad scene. I like this scene a lot. Andy's a bad parent, but whatever. Uh, No, 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 no. I'm going to say, like, once he starts to pay attention, I'm not going to I'm not going to blame Andy for not paying attention to his kid because his kid does stupid shit. 90% he of the eats time. shit on this episode as a parrot the entire way not through this scene, not this scene. Yeah, this, this scene is good. This scene is good. This is good, Andy, in this scene. If that, and the reason I say it's good is because Opie just flat out asked the question, how can I get Karen to like me? And. Andy gets about as close as you can to saying you can't make someone like you. Yeah. He says, it kind of seems like it, like she likes you just fine, but to get her to like you the way you want, uh, I guess you just got to be nice to her. It's up to the love bug if he'll bite. And which is basically him saying, like, it's up to her if she's going to like you back. And then he says, but if you keep liking her and she doesn't like you back, you're going to get over it. We disagree on how good of a job he's doing in this scene. Because he has seen firsthand why Opie's whole thing isn't really working. And he should say, like, but you have to be confident. And actually, like, show interest in her and ask her questions. Because Opie is just yelling information at her. Basically yelling lies at her. And it's not working. And he should just be like, yeah, be really nice. But also, you know, be yourself. Be comfortable in your own shoes. Show interest in her. Give, I think, her, I think, give I think, him literally any actionable advice whatsoever. I think, Dan, where we're, where we're conflicting here is where and you wish that Andy defined what be nice means. Because being nice to a person does mean, like, asking questions about them and showing interest in what they do, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, Andy doesn't really get into that. He's just like, keep being nice to her. But what I appreciate, because I did not expect this, is he doesn't say she will like you if you're nice. Yeah. He doesn't say, like, continue to be nice and she'll come around or whatever. He doesn't do any of that stuff. He's just like, 
keep doing your thing and maybe she'll like you maybe she won't you know no matter what happens you'll be okay which is a lot more than i expected like a lot more progressive than i expected to hear this i really expected to some very bad advice and based on that scale like this scene is fine that's fine. He could have been he could have been better. He could have said like, "Yes, actually pay attention to the girl that you like." Uh but also, we've seen how Andy acts around women too. So, yeah. based on that, like this is a fucking gold star for him. I'm grading on a curve. I'm but... hard thumbs downing cuz he he's seen he's basically saying like, "Well, Opie, just keep doing all the stuff that pisses her off." <laughs> and and when she decides that she doesn't like you, it's fine. Like he's he watched Opie work and Karen. All he did was piss Karen the fuck off. He couldn't like help his kid course correct even a little bit. Just tell him to be comfortable in his own skin and stop pretending to be an adult man. Uh, all right, Opie. Here's the, here's how you read the room. Yeah, like. <laughs> Have you tried asking her literally a single question about herself? Have you given that a shot, Opie? Don't, I'm not being like, well, here's Andy's guide to bagging a dame. But just, like, you know, give him, like, something to work with. Eh. He's basically setting Opie up for failure and telling him that it's going to be okay when he fails. That, that's fine, though, because he doesn't want his eight-year-old to have a girlfriend, right? He, do, he doesn't... He doesn't really want or care if this works out for Opie. <laughs> That's like, <hilarious. laughs> Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't blame him for that. I wouldn't want my eight-year-old, nine-year-old son to, like, have a girlfriend that he's obsessed over either. Like, whatever. He doesn't... See, he, I would be not a good that, parent. ...that committed. So, anyway, he's pretty much... At that point, he's like, all right, Opie, shut up and go to bed. Um, <laughs> yeah, get the fuck out of here. Next day... I need to find out what Blondie's doing. That's a comic strip, right? Yes, it's a comic strip. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Come on, man. You know what a comic strip is. Oh, the boondocks. You guys sure do have some opinions. <laughs> so, yeah, he sends Opie to bed, and it cuts to the next day outside. Barney and... It's a Thelma Lou episode. She's in this. They're walking around. She kind of gets stuff to do in this episode. <laughs> I think we find out that bit? her job is working at the grocery store. Oh, I thought she was just going to the grocery store. I, it felt like he was walking her to work. It's a vague inclination I have, which would make sense because eventually she does have to have a job. Um, <laughs> yeah, Barney uh, and Thelma Lou are walking to the grocery store, uh, and it looks like Barney's on his way to work. Uh, and they run into Opie, who is sitting on the steps of the hotel, I noticed, just looking yeah. miserable, just like it, poking his books, basically. Yeah, they see him. They're like, hey, Opie. And Opie's like, I'm in love. Uh, Thelma Lou is is concerned. Barney does not give a fuck. (laughs) He's like, yeah, it's just a sad child who gives a shit. Uh, They they do get to the to the grocery store, and Thelma Lou's like, okay, well here we are. So maybe she does work there. I don't know. Yeah. Um, And then they Barney goes to work. He goes to the jail where Andy's just like hanging out cleaning rifles for some reason. Barney pretends to stick Andy up. Uh, they have a delightful chuckle at that. And so they have a discuss. like, Barney's like, hey, your kid's really fucking sad. Any reason for that? And he's like, oh, yeah, he's falling in love with a girl. And Barney asks, what advice did you give him? And he's like, oh, yeah, I just told him to be nice. This inspires one of the most insane monologues of the run of this entire goddamn show. Because, you, like, Barney's like, well, here's what, here's my opinion of uh, uh, of how you should treat a woman, and you're thinking it's gonna be like, oh, Barney's gonna give a bunch of bad advice, like uh, they're all gonna be stupid, like pickup artist things, and he's like, all women are bitches, and you yeah. need to break their fucking spirits. It's like yes. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like he goes on a fucking rampage, digs up ch- un unresolved childhood trauma and then goes on an insane power fantasy and then is like have your kid do that Outside, I'm 
is just around the corner. Right? So it's way more like the Stokehold, isn't it? <laughs> well, I sure did like her. She didn't like me back, though. Oh, well, no, 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 not so much. No, well, but most of it was stuck up. single time. What? She used to bite off the end, sip out all the syrup, and leave me with nothing but the ice. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, Barney starts, he starts from nice guys finish last and just goes worse from there. Uh, yeah. he, he yells about a uh, girl that he used to like named Vicky Harms. and uh, But he's like, Vicky Harms was stuck up and had her nose in the air and wouldn't pay attention to me and treat me like dirt, even if I like offered her something. There's one thing, I always used to come up to her when I had a snow cone. And he goes off on this snow cone for... A long time. He's like, you know how I always used to love snow cones. They were my favorite. And he's like, yeah, raspberry. He's like, fucking raspberry. Love that. I loved raspberry snow cones. I used to offer my snow cone to Vicky as a bite. And you know what she used to do? She used to bite at the end, sip out all the syrup, and leave me with nothing but the ice. Was she biting through wax? What the fuck? Did she just Which like begs several questions of why, if she did that once, why did you keep doing it? Some and real Aunt fucking Charlie Brown, like, having the football yanked away shit. And she was probably doing it because some weird kid kept waving a snow cone in her face, and she was desperately trying to get him to leave her alone. And, like, so, like this score, like, he's carrying this childhood act with him as a a, a metric for grown women like, yeah this clearly scarred him and he's so bitter about this this isn't funny it comes across really mean and just massively unhinged and then he has this very weird power fantasy about getting revenge on her <laughs> by showing up on her door and <laughs> drinking a snow cone in front of her as an act of petty vengeance <laughs> And Andy's response to this is just to remind him, you're 35 years old. Yeah. Specifically says, yeah, she would probably be pretty freaked out if a 35-year-old man showed up on her door and drank a snow cone. He says, says, like, if a 35-year-old man showed up at my door with a snow cone, I wouldn't answer the door. (laughs) Yeah. Like, but a healthy response would be, Give me your gun right now. I don't care if it's unloaded. I don't, I cannot risk the possibility of you eventually finding out where Vicky lives. This bit, I'm, I, I can't even say it didn't age well. It's just not, it wasn't good to begin with. It bleeds men's right activist. Like primordial stew red pill shit of like, all women are bitches and you must dominate them to win their affection. Yeah, uh, and the fact that he's like using stuff as a ch- from being a child to justify it, it's just serial killer shit. Yeah, that there, is there's, some a, there's Buffalo a fine line with a, shit. with a character like Barney. Like, I feel like there's you can do like dumb kind of skeezy like womanizer character 
And there is a fine line between that and just full born misogynist. And this cannot see the fucking line anymore. It is so far past it. It Marty, just catapults of trebuchets all the way over it. I'm um, going to write like a movie where there is the snow cone killer who leaves melted snow cones at the bodies of his victims. And that will be the monologue he does from his jail cell of like, there was once a little girl named Vicky Harm. She used to drink the bottoms out of my snow cones. And that's what I wanted to do was go to her house and drink a snow cone in front of her. Like, while he rocks back and forth in a fucking straight jacket, blends seamlessly into the fucking movie. Mr. Sheriff Taylor, you could have found her. (laughs) I gave you all the clues. (laughs) Came out a little bit more Gomer than Barney, but all right. (laughs) I don't care who's still in the snowman reference. Cut out me praising you for it, but that was really good. Uh, They're outside of the grocery store, and Opie is trying to uh, impress Karen as she walks by. He basically does, like, parkour! But it's really, like, (laughs) he's trying to do a handstand, but he fails, like, three times. uh, And Karen just, like, patiently waits for him to finish. He finally does the handstand. Uh, with his feet up against the wall. So, like, not that impressive, Opie. Uh, but he finally does a handstand, and he says, Look what I can do, Karen. Can you do this? And Karen goes, Yes, but I don't think it's very ladylike, and just walks away. Yeah. You know she was waiting for that. The only reason she stood still watching him try and fail three or four times to do it was because she came up with that line on the first try and was just waiting to deploy it. Okay, so remember when I said that Andy should give his son vague dating advice about being himself? To avoid this exact situation. This situation is fine for a nine-year-old. This is fine. He tried four times to do a fucking handstand in public. Yeah, I mean, dude, part of Karen's gonna go to school and be like, you will not believe what this little dipshit did. I mean, look, neither of us are parents, but I imagine that part of being a parent is just... Watching your kid do stupid shit and just being like, "Yeah, that kid's doing some stupid shit." I guess I'm gonna do nothing to stop it. (laughs) Yeah, that's absolutely what I. Yeah, uh, that's probably like half the fun is just watching your kid eat shit. Yeah, he's eating shit in a way that doesn't hurt anyone and doesn't really do any permanent, long lasting damage to him. That's that's a that's a win, right? You you get to laugh at how much your kid sucks at this when no one gets hurt. Wait, no counterpoint. You just literally saw what happens when a child has unresolved romantic trauma as a child. They turn into fucking Barney. Okay, yeah, no. But 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 that that's a different thing. Andy's not a bad father because of the advice he does or doesn't give uh, in this scene. Andy's a bad father because he continues to allow contact with Barney Fife. Oh, that's also true. Yeah. <laughs> his his advice should have absolutely been stay the fuck away from my son. Do not try to tell my son anything about romance ever again, or I will drive you out to the edge of town and leave you there. In the background, Thelma Lou walks outside of the grocery store and she sees this scene and just sees Opie eat shit uh, and is kind of like, she takes pity on Opie. She's like, oh, okay. To cheer Opie up, she comes up. She's like, hmm, my grocery packages are ready. If only I had a big, strong man to help me carry them and then I could give them ice cream and fudge brownies. And Andy comes up and he's like, oh, sounds like Thelma Lou needs some help. And I gotta say, like, I like this bit. I like this moment. Yeah. Uh, There's way more chemistry between Thelma Lou and Andy uh, than ever between Thelma Lou and Barney. Um, Between basically, like, Thelma Lou and Barney or Andy and literally any woman that's ever been on this show. I Maybe I'm making this up, too, but this episode, like, it feels like the fashion designers for this episode... Gave Thelma Lou an actual figure in this. Yeah. Like, like her her clothes are a little bit more shapely, a little bit more form-fitting. Uh, and at first time you're like, oh yeah, Thelma Lou's hot. Yeah, like, Thelma Lou is hot. It's weird. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's been three seasons and she's been so, like, desexualized because she's basically a prop for Barney. This is yeah. the first episode where we've seen her do anything and have, like, most any personality. And uh, I think they showed that off. Uh, this is, like, the most agency a woman has ever had on this show. It's it's damn near, honestly. Uh, at least since she who not, will not be named left. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Opie and Thumbaloo walks walk off. Barney's coming up to go on a date, uh, and it, Barney's immediately jealous of a child. Opie and Thumbaloo walk away, and then the camera pans real fast around a corner, and a piccolo just goes like a doo 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 doo, and it zooms in on Karen, who is now jealous of an adult woman. She uh, sucks. You know what? You know what? I'm gonna say again: age matters. It's cute. That a little girl is jealous of an adult woman. It's fucking weird that a grown man is jealous of a child. Yes. Like, they both suck, but fucking Barney sucks so much worse. Again, Andy should never let Barney anywhere near his child. The fact that Barney cannot understand that a boy is not a, comp- a competitive rival for his girlfriend is insane. Like every once in a while, we mention how good the music is uh, on this episode or on these episodes. Earl Hagen really gets a lot of chances to stretch his legs on mm-hmm. this. He gives like some sultry jazz bits to Barney, who is like getting ready for a date. Uh, there's some like lonely, almost wind chimes esque bits where uh, Karen looks around for Opie to walk her somewhere, and Opie's nowhere to be found. Just. Just good work by the soundtrack all together in this. Uh, I'd say every fourth or fifth episode, Earl Hagen really gets to stretch his legs. And and it's it's worth pointing out. Yeah. The next scene is Barney walks into the jail. Uh, and he's just painting. The, yeah. The, he's painting the banister uh, or the little barrier between the office and the jail part for some reason. It, like, they gi- they're giving characters the weirdest things to do in this fucking episode. Yeah. Yeah, like it, it's really. This is the second time that we've just seen Andy just in the jail doing busy work, just yeah. like, just like, like puttering, just tinkering. He's just being a dad, a garage dad. Like th- there's just the epilogue scene. was him building a deck. <laughs> yeah, there's just one scene where they're having a conversation and Barney's just casually scaling a fish. Like <laughs> Opie is just like talking about his feelings at one point. He's feeding a gecko. It's weird. It's a yeah. very weird episode. <laughs> Uh, fucking, uh, it, this kicks off the weirdest fucking scene, because he's, like, Andy is like, like, oh, Barney comes in and he's like, hey, what's up with your kid talking to my girl? And Bar- Andy is just like, he's sad, so your girlfriend is helping him feel better. And Barney just basically says, cool, 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 just quick tidbit, I'm a fuck Thelma Lou by the duck pond later. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah. So explicitly, I am barely reading between the lines there. He's like, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do a drive to, with Thelma Lou to the duck park. And when we get there, K Sara Sara. So he is explicitly to his friend, like, I'm a fucker. Andy describes it as, he says, you're going to go up there and have a little smoochin' party, huh? Ugh. Smoochin' party. Uh, I do want to point out that when Barney walks into the room, he says, hey, do you think Opie's still at Thelma Lou's? And Andy, again, just only halfway interested in anyone else, goes, I don't know. He's probably <laughs> not there by now. I have no idea where my son is. Shut up. You think I'm <laughs> supposed to know where my son is? Fuck off. Maybe he's in the woods. What? What is? What, what am I, his keeper? Who gives I've, a shit? I've certainly learned nothing from the many, many times we've lost this kid. <laughs> yeah. He has arms. He's responsible for his own life. Fuck off. It's not just that he doesn't know where his son is. He doesn't seem to care. He's just like, I don't know. He might be there. Might he's be not. not. He's not like, hmm, that's a good question. I wonder where my only child is. The one that will eventually carry on my name after I'm dead. That's a, that's, that's a good question. He's just like, Pfft. Fuck off, I'm reading the newspaper. Marmaduke's at it again! This dog cannot stay out of trouble! Oh, 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 look at that, Pearls Before Swine. I did not see that pun coming. (laughs) Oh, oh, get fuzzy. Bucky keeps raising such havoc. These cats report the news? (laughs) Too many newspaper comic bits. You've infected me with your madness. They're cats and they report the news. Have you seen this shit? (laughs) <laughs> oh, why do you people listen to us? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so Barney is like, yep, uh, just a quick update to you, my good friend. I'm gonna get it in tonight. I know you're interested in that. Uh, 
just, I, just, just the woman that's taking care of your kid right now, gonna fuck her. So, so he calls her on the phone. Opie is at Thumbaloo's house, and Thumbaloo's like, oh, you should answer it. By the way, uh, I've been looking at apartments and houses lately, and this is how I know that I'm an old man, because we, we saw the interior of Thumbaloo's home, and my first thought was, oh, what a lovely kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> though, so Opie goes to the very tasteful Center Island counter in uh, uh, Thumbaloo's kitchen. where she In a delightful farmhouse style. Yeah. Electric stove, not big fan. Could have used gas. Uh... And he answers the phone, uh, and this makes Barney furious. And I I like this scene a lot. I like this scene a lot because uh, Opie keeps saying, like, Oh, Thamalu's busy. I can have messages. Oh, you want to go for a drive? Where are you going to go for a drive to? He's driving around? You're going to go to the duck pond? Why would you go to the duck pond at night, Barney? You can't, you can't see any ducks. And th- <laughs> there's a close-up of Thelma Lou's face as she overhears this, and her eyes light up. She's just like, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, Bar- Barney's screaming, give Thelma Lou the phone. And Thelma Lou's like, no. <laughs> Ask him to explain. <laughs> Ask him to explain to you, small child, why he wants to take me to the duck pond. Do it! Do it! Any sane man would just say, okay, I'll call back later when there isn't a small child. And he's like, I need, I guess, I'm not hanging up. So I get, I'm not hanging up. Hanging up is admitting defeat. And she's gonna understand that I want to have sex in the park tonight. So this kid's kind of forcing my hand. He's gonna ask a woman if I can fuck her. So (laughs) it's his fault, if anything. (laughs) And gets so sexually frustrated at a small child. <laughs> like, it is not an overstatement that Barney Fife gets mad at a young boy for sexual reasons. <laughs> it's and, and so then, bad. And then he slams the phone down and runs away. Next scene. Opie is, it's probably the next day, Opie is moping outside of the hotel again. At some point in time, Jason's got to, like, open the door and be like, kid, fucking leave. Kid, go be sad at another business for ten minutes. God, you're driving away all of my customers, the various <laughs> tourists that come to to Mayberry. The uh, people your father trap in this town come stay here. You can't be bumming them out. You're blocking the way of all of our plot devices. <laughs> yeah. So, Just a traveling salesman, like, well, I had an interesting backstory, but I guess I'm off into the night! And Jason's just like, ah! <laughs> they see Opie. By they, I mean Barney and Andy. Look at that. It's still not working. He's still really sad. You know what? Maybe it's time for me to step in and give Opie some tips and from somebody who really knows how to handle women. And Andy's response to this is to go, huh, and walk off. Like, yeah. he does nothing. He grunts slightly disaffectedly and walks away which i found hilarious i know i'm backseat parenting a lot but i have i i've read a couple of books i know like a little thing and what you do in a situation like this is that you put the person in a chokehold and you drag (laughs) them off and like that's in the books when a deranged lunatic tries to give dating advice to your child you are supposed to apply pressure like under the arm and to the neck until they pass out like yeah that's, sta- that's standard mr spock like. yeah basically yeah andy walks away and barney goes up and says hey let me give you a couple of fast tips the next time your girl comes by uh step out say here I am, you lucky girl. Play your cards right, and I'll let you walk with me. I li- might even let you hold my hand. Creepy thing to tell a child to do. And then he, like, steps back, and, uh, da 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 Thelma Lou walks out. The, I, I, I like the direction on this. We should point it out. Opie walks away, uh, and off screen, we hear him do it, and then we hear Thelma Lou's voice. So all we see is Barney's reaction. I thought that was a nice directorial touch. Yeah. Um, we see... Thelma Lou and uh, Opie walk kind of like, you say hit, holding hands. I think they're arm in arm here. Uh, and Barney gets mad. Uh, he storms off. Karen a- sees. And Karen draws the conclusion of like, all right, this was a suspicion. And it has been confirmed. 
Opie's macking on adult bitches, and I underestimated his value as a potential romantic partner. <laughs> He's making moves in the major leagues, and I should lock that down. Let's 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 look at this from little girl logic. I was getting attention, and now I'm not. <laughs> like that's <laughs> that's not like anything about women. That's just children. That's children I in general. Her, like her- my interpretation of Karen's deranged mind better. <laughs> No, so. no, like, and I do, I do like this bit too. Like Karen, like walks over. She looks at the steps where she normally meets Opie. Oh, that's that's why Opie's hanging out because he. That's where Karen normally walks by. Whatever. That's not really right, explained yeah. very well. Where she looks at the steps where where she normally meets Opie, and she like looks around, like almost like a horror movie. Like she's like in the town where there's no one here, and she realizes what's happening. Barney. Screams into the jail to Opie to yell. You know. <laughs> Goes in so hot, and he's like, "Your son is cock blocking me, and I want to know what you're going to do about it." And Andy, and Andy's re- <laughs> and he's just like, "Fuck all." <laughs> and his I response give is just less like, of a shit. No, his his response is so funny. He turns around and goes, "Yeah, well, I mean, looks like Aunt Opie's got more game than we thought, but don't worry." He's got to go to bed at 8.30, so you've got all <laughs> night to catch up. Just, again, reminding him, like, you are a grown man, and he is a small child. Like, but, but also driving home the fact that, yes, our Barney is losing. <laughs> Just really, like, putting it into, like... He cannot help but poke Barney's lizard brain of just being like, the child is beating you. The child is beating you. I yeah. would, too. Like... There's, there's only one thing you can do with MRAs like like Barney, and that's mock them mercilessly. <laughs> like, but he's going to kidnap. If this had gone on for like another day, Barney would have like thrown Opie in a burlap sack and tossed him into the river. They're like, that'll teach you to emasculate me, small child. Andy's whole shtick is, you know what? Don't fucking worry about it. Tomorrow's Saturday. He's gonna go play. That this is where I think. Uh, Andy really messes up is he it does not realize how long a childhood crush can go uh, he thinks this is Years. all gonna blow, blow over very quickly and when it doesn't he's very surprised uh, which is the very next scene right that's the next day it's Saturday Barney's like straightening up to go on a date uh, the, the like jazz that music the, the that I mentioned sexy music plays. yeah the like jazz vamp that I mentioned earlier is playing Opie comes in Andy, Andy is once again just like, I think he's fixing a chair in this. Yeah. Once again, just puttering. Andy goes to the fucking closet and pulls out his model train set. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Starts putting it together. Starts creating a ship in a bottle. I just, did, he, did you have any actual work to do, Andy? Like Bob Sweeney making very strange <laughs> choices this episode. Opie rolls in and he's like, hey, you know how you said that uh, you will get over being in love with someone pretty quickly. And he's like, uh-huh. Well, you're right. Now that Thelma lose my girl, I don't think about Karen ever. You hear that, Karen? You hear that? You hear how much I'm not thinking about you? <laughs> That's why I nailed a note to Karen's door saying exactly that. How happy I am with Thelma Lou. <laughs> also, I kidnapped her dog. <laughs> Barney hears this and he just leaves. He's just like, I gotta go. And just... <laughs> the storm's out. I'm sexually frustrated for reasons involving a child. Ha! And so... Please never clip... Nobody clip that. <laughs> I'm gonna make that a sound button. <laughs> no, fuck. We might have to edit that out. That's too dangerous. So he storms out, and Andy says, Huh. I've been doing okay so far. I better rectify this situation with some severe sexism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and it's kind of crazy that, like, when I watched this the first time, this just, like, slid over my brain of just, like, yeah, 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 whatever. But, yeah, it's his explanation is, like, listen, women suck ass. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> did I uh, nail it? I feel like I nailed it. Andy says, he's like, oh, so you're going to hang out with Thelma Lou, huh? I guess you guys are going to go bike riding? Oh, wait, nope. Grown women don't go bike riding. Yeah. You guys gonna go climb trees? No, nope. grown women wear high heels. They can't they can't go on trees. Uh you guys gonna go to a movie you can't go to a cowboy movie with a grown woman, right? They like kissing movies. And finally Opie's like, What the fuck do grown do you do with grown women? And Andy's like, Let me tell you, you go shopping with them. 
women be shopping. Uh, and you go dress shopping, and then you go hat shopping, and then you go shoe shopping, and then you meet their mom. D- end of pitch. Uh, which, which, like, really towards the end makes me go, Andy, do you like women? Yeah. You really don't seem like you do. Uh, it's pretty much just a whole stick. And I think, I think there's two reasons why this didn't, like, register with us at first. It's because, like, number one, the first time you watch this, you're just like, aha, yeah, that's right. That's the difference between being a child and being an adult. He's, he's doing this like an age thing. And it doesn't quite register that he's just like, yeah, here's every single stereotype about women. They're all true. Uh, and number two, Barney's like overt MRA ness serves as like a smoke screen. Yeah. So, like, he just like runs cover, whereas Andy's just like, yeah, here's, uh, here's some of the latent, casual misogyny the real the normal kind the the acceptable level right barney just shifted that overton window so that we just kind of ignore what andy does well it's like yeah it starts to be like a valid thing of like because you're different ages you have different interests and then it's just but then there's just this end thing of like also a grown-ass woman sucks shit opie's just like i understand women deteriorate as they age wonderful Opie goes outside. (laughs) Opie goes outside and Karen says, hey, do you want to go to a cowboy movie? Do you want to pay attention to me like you used to be paying attention to me? Come pay attention to me some more. Let's go to a cowboy movie. Uh, Opie comes in. He's like, hey, I'm going to go hang out with Karen. Thumbaloo will be cool, right? You're going to take care of this. Cool. I'm going to go. And then they walk. And then Opie and no, Opie is like, hey, Dad, can you break up with Thelma Lou for me? And Andy's like, that's totally an appropriate thing to do. Yeah! <laughs> like, just sending the worst signals. Like, yeah, totally. Break up with them via text message. Awesome. Get out of here. Go date another woman without properly breaking up with the first one. Hell yeah, you they little scout They weren't dating, Dan. That's, Opie doesn't fucking know that. <laughs> No, I I think in this particular case that's a perfectly acceptable thing. You want you want your th- your son to walk away from his fantasies about the grown woman as quickly as possible. Just clean break. Don't bring it up again. This is ass parenting. All of it is dog shit parenting. You're doing the worst apology tour for him. <laughs> oh, his fucking brain in regards to the opposite sex has been irreversibly fucked. He has any, any possibility of having a healthy relationship with the opposite sex has been shot in the head. Opie and Karen walk away and they're holding hands and it's cute. There's a cute little bit. Yeah. Cute cute two little kids going to the movies holding hands. It's cute. Whatever. Stinger. Yeah. The next day at the jail, Barney. Infidelity. Barney's like, you know what? I'm going to make sure that Thumbaloo, when Thumbaloo walks in, I'm going to like make her think that I wasn't waiting around for her. You know, I was, I'm going to make her think that like, I'm so busy all the time that I, I don't need, I don't need Thumbaloo. Quick note. Remember, as always, Barney is constantly trying to cheat on his girlfriend. Consistently. Constantly. Always. Like. I think at this point, successfully cheating on his girlfriend. Yeah. I, it's just that little bit of context makes so much difference. Thumbaloo comes in, uh, and, but Barney has his back to her and he's on the phone. Uh, talking to the phone and yeah. and just saying, oh, uh, I guess I can't make any commitments uh, on our date, other woman. I can't guarantee I'll be free on Saturday night, other woman. And then yeah. the phone rings while he's pretending to be on it. And Barney is like, God damn it. Andy makes fun of him and he's like, you going to get that? You going to get that phone? You're closer. But Thelma Lou gets the last laugh because Thelma Lou's like... Uh, I guess it sucks that you're going to be busy on Saturday. Like, I thought we were going to go to the duck pond and walks away. And just. Yeah. And, and then Andy's just like, well, maybe you can ask Opie for advice on getting her back. So, yeah, Barney just got like probably like, temporarily dumped. I feel like this exposes a little bit about Thelma Lou and Barney's relationship. I feel like this kind of exposes that Thelma Lou is like aware of this shit like it it kind of shows that the reason Thelma Lou puts up with so much because she doesn't give a shit yeah she's, she's just like she's like I don't like you all that much we hook up sometimes I, I think because at one point she's like I want him to have my kids and now she's just like fucking go fuck another woman I don't give a shit fuck you 
just real, real more more evidence fodder for the Don Knotts equals Pete Davidson kind of uh, theory here. Yeah. Just, just some real Pete Davidson, Ariana Grande shit going on here. A pure evil concept that someone on Twitter whispered into existence. I, and, all right. Yeah. Good for Thelma Lou. Whatever. Thelma Lou is like, don't fucking skin off my back. Thelma Lou is the champion of this episode. Really. Uh, she rules. Best character on the show by a fucking mile. Ratings. Andy Meter. I kind of like this episode. It had its moments. I'll put it at a five. I was going to give it like a seven. Uh, it, it's it's inter- it's entertaining. I've definitely laughed. The show mercilessly mocks how bad Barney is. And, yeah, and like every time someone mocks Barney is great, uh, deservedly. And then the Barney meter. How gross, messed up is this? It's a hard one to place. I'm gonna put it at a nine. Um, I feel, I feel like we're both gonna have pretty high ratings for different reasons. All right, there's three layers of fucked up because there's. Adult man getting mad at a child for romantic reasons. There is uh, Barney's over MRA misogyny, which is treated as bad, but not nearly as bad as it should be treated in, like, any fucking healthy human context. And then there's Andy's fucking, like, dagger in the side sexism that he just sneaks in there. So, like, it's got layers of what the fuck going on. And, like... By, after a certain point, like wh- like we said, you're so exhausted by the other forms of, of horribleness that the Andy one doesn't even fucking register. It doesn't register for us. A woman texted us and was like, yo, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, almost immediately. Fuck that. We honestly, with if Marta hadn't texted us, there was a solid chance that this, this, would, this would be like, yeah, it's a five. The thing Barney said was pretty fucked up, but I don't know. We've seen worse. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Your your monthly reminder that we are dipshits. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to put it at like at like an eight. Uh, and it, it, a big part of that is the like sliding scale of sexism between Andy and Barney there. Um, but there are, there are other like factors that I find mitigating and redeeming about this. Uh, I like more than you. I like Andy's original approach, like his original approach of maybe she'll like you. Maybe she won't. That's kind of up to her. She'll get, you'll get over it, uh, is surprisingly progressive, surprisingly something I did not expect from uh, 1963. Yeah. So, like, I find that very redeeming. Uh, And I find the, like, amount of control that Thelma Lou suddenly has in the relationship uh, compared to everything else a little bit redeeming. Like, the fact that she's just like, fucking whatever, dude. I don't care. Uh, That's a new development, and I like that. So yeah, this this falls somewhere between a seven and an eight for me on the Barney meter. So there is one other episode that we watched for this uh, that I think we can probably run through real quick because it's it's nothing. It's nothing really. Yeah, it's. But you, let's let's just slide let's just slide on into it. Um, it's it is a funny one. Uh, it's uh, supposedly Andy Griffiths himself's f- uh, favorite episode. And yeah, it's it, nice. It's a nice little episode. And it is uh, Season 3, Episode 27, Barney's First Car. Originally airs April 1st, 1963. uh, Written by Jim Fritzel and Everett Greenbaum. And directed by... Thinks it's real fucking funny to go to karaoke night and do tequila, Bob Sweeney. Opium-addicted wig salesman, Bob Sweeney. (laughs) And here is your one-sentence summary from Wikipedia. Barney spends his $300 worth of life savings on a car from the elderly Mrs. Lesh that turns out to be a lemon. Okay, all right. Good job this time, Wikipedia. Good job not spoiling the quote-unquote twist. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so that's... That I is, mean, the fact that the car is a lemon is, is the twist. It's the, it's, the only, it's the only really plot point. That's the plot of the episode, uh, is that Barney walks in, uh, he's holding a bunch of money, uh, he's in the jail and he announces that he's withdrawn all the money that he has in the savings account, $300, the ultra-reliable Mayberry Wiki says that's about $2,500 in today's money, and I'm not gonna check it. Barney walks in, the way he delivers this is really weird, he comes in and he's just like, hey, Guess what I've got? And he just flashes his $300. 
And he's like, this is why I'm in such a good mood, because I have $300. But it's $300 that he it's, already had. Yeah. It, it's, he, he's acting like he's in a good mood because he did something that got him an extra $300. Like, it, it, he's acting like he was just like, hey, guess what I found in the fucking street? <laughs> Basically, what he says is like, I'm very excited because I'm about to spend $300. It's yeah, it's like it's like you see this money. I'm about to not have it anymore. Ooh boy! I tell you, I just bought a car two weeks ago. Humble brag. When you have no boo, when you have the money to buy a car, and you look at the car, and you're like, oh, it's not fun to to give that money away. It's not fun to. Give somebody a check for a large sum of money, even if it means you walk away from a car. You're not like you're a little hype about it, but like you're very much. I don't know if I want to do this. Maybe that's just yeah. me, but like, no, yeah, I, you're, I would you're never. Like, am be... I making a huge mistake the entire time? You, you you do that you do that midwestern thing right where if anybody asks, says like, hey, nice car, you're like, yeah, I got it at a great deal. I need you to know how little money I spent on this car. I need you to know how fiscally responsible it was for me to buy this. <laughs> to be fair, I do that for any transaction over four hundred dollars. Oh, yeah, very clear. Like <laughs> I'm almost thirty, and anything that involves spending over two hundred bucks, I'm like, oh god, am I about to ruin my entire life? Yeah, that's because you and I are rational, logical human beings, and we know that having money is a disgrace, and people who have money are the worst. And we yeah. should, we should uh, pretend like we're, we don't, even if we do. Yeah. Which we don't. <laughs> Which we do not. <laughs> Which we do not. Support our podcast on Patreon. Please, um, God. Barney's going through the like classified ads. He sees an ad for a 1954 Ford. By the way, Ford is a sponsor of the show. That's why every single sh- car that gets mentioned on this episode is a Ford. And also, it's a it's a sponsor of this show. Breaking Mayberry. We're built Ford tough. Breaking Mayberry is brought to you by the all new Ford Fusion. I've been watching New Girl a lot, like rewatching mm-hmm. the show New Girl, and there's an episode in the second season of New Girl that just becomes a Ford commercial. It's incredible. <laughs> it's so bad. They just put a Ford commercial right in the middle of the fucking episode. It's like they just talk about the all new Ford Focus while Zoe Deschanel like bumbles around in the background. It's like, the best bit because they're just like basically new girl looks you in the eye is like yeah it's a Ford ad now the fuck you gonna do about it huh you're still huh? gonna watch this you're still gonna yeah. watch this you know why you're gonna watch this because Jake Johnson is delightful yeah this is an unexpectedly wonderful show based on an ensemble cast it it really goes downhill in the third season it, 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 the last season literally just steals the the whole time jump thing from Parks and Rec. We should talk about uh, New Girl on the show sometime, because it's a very good show, and there's also a lot of moments in that show that made me go, was this supposed to be feminist? This feels oh. very anti-feminist. This feels like a CSI psyop against feminism. Uh, it, there is an episode of How Dare You Have Periods, Women. There, there's an entire episode where the hottest character is just like, you know what sucks? Dude's asking for consent. Ugh, yeah. Moving on. Like, well, let's talk about this fucking show. Barney calls it up because he's really excited to buy this car. Uh, he says it looks like a great deal. And the next day, Barney and Andy are sitting on Andy's front porch. And this old, old woman drives up in this car and gives her, gives them a smokescreen of story. Absolutely powerful pitch to a couple of rubes. Basically, it just does like the standard thing of like, my dead husband had this car and now he's dead and I have this car. And Barney's like, I need a car. Um, which, how the fuck did they, she find these guys? I, I don't know. And she's, and she like pushes it just like, my dear husband Bernard, you know, Bernard as in Barney used to own this car and I never drove it. I only took it. I never take it over 25 miles an hour. That's why it took me four hours to get here from Mount Pilot. Oh. Oh. Here's something. And she's very confident. Because she even says, like, you should take this car to a mechanics. Please drive it around. But Barney is so, like, horny for this. He's just like, here, here, here. Take take my $300. Please take it. Yeah. No, she's she's running a scam and she puts it 
all out on the fucking table. She is, like, really betting on this human being being Barney Fife. Like, she is gambling. She she must be an expert con woman because she can spot a grade A moron just from a fucking mile away. Like, she just one shots and has been like, I can leave it all out on the fucking table with this guy. Uh, you, you gotta respect a good con. You know what? Yeah, this is, this is another Andy con man episode and Andy doesn't spot it. Andy's just like a concerned friend who's like, you should probably, you should probably have this looked out. Uh, he, he, he has he, one moment at the end where he is like, wait, what the fuck? But then it's over. Yeah. It's too late. He also is like, you should probably not pay $300 for this car that's nearly 10 years old. You should probably pay like 120 100 Barney's like, here's all the money I have in the world. Bye. So he buys the car. And then there's like a bit of like, Barney wants to drive all of them to church. He uh, does a big like power thing of like telling everyone where they're going to sit in the car. A good 30% of this episode is just the entire main cast. I feel like this is somehow the only time we've seen the entire cast on screen at the same time. Uh, because it is Barney, Andy, Thelma Lou in the front seat, Aunt B, Opie, and Gomer in the back uh, to round things out. Having uh, a speaking line. Yeah. We don't need to worry about Gomer being terrible in this because he basically he doesn't do anything. The only bit that he does is he slams the door harder than Barney would have liked, whatever. And, like, 30% of this episode is just there driving with the, like, screen projector behind them so it looks like roads are going, uh, and then parts start falling out of the car. At one point in time, uh, the steering column begins to, like, push towards Barney, like, the alien tongue in Alien 3. Well, they do, like, Middle Eastern snake music. It's pretty funny, yeah. It's pretty good bit. I yeah. can get what I get. What this is, Andy Griffith's favorite episode. Yeah, and so like a whole bunch of it is that. Finally, the car uh, dies. It overheats, and everybody pushes it back to town while Thelma Lou is steering. Gomer comes back to the courthouse and says, "Hey, Wally just checked out the car. Here is a list of car parts." And then Gomer gets the important, the important reveal, uh, which is something that I didn't know. He, like, shows that there was sawdust in the transmission and the differential, uh, which means that worn-out gears will run smoothly for a couple of days. Uh, mm -hmm. And Andy goes, oh, that's the oldest car hustler trick in the book, which it's tells me, like, cool. yeah, it's a, good, it's a good move. But also, again, like, had Barney not been Barney, had Barney actually taken that to a mechanic, they would be fucked. Yeah, there is one thing, just to circle back real fa fast, it's my favorite shot in the uh, in the episode, because they, um, they're doing a thing where, like, Barney, after the car is revealed to be, like, falling apart, goes catatonic. So at first, it's Barney in the front seat with Andy driving, uh, and then they cut to Barney in the front seat with Thelma Lou driving, and then it is revealed that everyone else is pushing the car, including Aunt B and Opie, which is funny as shit it is just, really good it's a great shot of just an old woman pushing a car uh by the way real nitpicky bit that uh i'm gonna point out and uh that the ultra reliable mayberry wiki points out barney did own a car in the first season uh in the uh runaway kid episode which we call andy causes an amber alert Barney oh, does yeah. own a car. We make a whole big deal about how uh, Opie and friends can push it in front of a fire hydrant and then leave. But maybe he sold it. Whatever. Doesn't. Yeah. It's it's not that important. Uh, oh, I've I've got the whole list of things that uh, that Gomer says, and I'm not going to do a Gomer voice, but it's plugs, Please. points, bearings, valves, rings, starter switch, ignition wire, water pump, fuel pump, oil pump, clutch, clutch bearings, clutch plate, brake lining, brake shoes, brake drums, radiator hose, and a radiator hose coupling. Also, you could use a good wash. Ma so basically, Marty, you need a car. Marty, if you ever actually do a Gomer impression on this show, I will immediately walk off the podcast. I Fair. will never do this ever again. Fair. Neither of us can ever do a Gomer impression. Gomer basically walks in and is like, hey, you know that uh, you know that J Johnny Cash song, One Piece at a Time? You need that. <laughs> you need to do that. <laughs> it just uh, basically says that the car is totaled. Yeah. Uh, also, another fun bit of trivia. At this point, I'm just reading the Mayberry Wiki. 
Years later, Don Knotts would be reunited with Andy Griffith on Matlock, where Mm -hmm. Knotts played Matlock's annoying neighbor, who was accused of killing a salesman who also sold him a a lemon of a car. That's a nice, that's nice. That's a nice little throwback. That's a nice little thing. That's whatever. I I love the idea that Don Knotts was Matlock's annoying neighbor. That's a good idea. Um... (laughs) Uh, All right. Between, so between this and The Simpsons, I really want to fuck watch Matlock uh, and just do grandpa quotes the entire time. I want to watch Matlock, and I also want to watch both old and new Perry Masons. Like, oh yeah. Uh, so God, we're getting so we're, fucking old. We're so fucking old. We suck so hard. Oh uh, my God! I used to have youth. I used to. I I used to do like illegal shit for fun, and now I just said I can't want to watch Matlock. I played in a band. I was in multiple bands. Oh, God. I used to have so much youthful energy. Fuck. Uh, oh, God. Hey, donate to our Patreon so that we can be euthanized. <laughs> like, oh, fuck. Donate, donate to our Patreon so that we can be, like, sent to upstate fucking New York to live out the remainder of our days on rocking chairs. That sounds lovely! Yeah. Dude, I- wear the... sweaters. Oh, dude, let's, let's fucking open up a farm in upstate New York. Let's just hang out. We can take care of ducks or whatever. Uh. <laughs> uh so anyway. <laughs> I'm wildly depressed now. Uh. Andy and Barney attempt to drive the car back to Mrs. Lesh in Mount Pilot. I don't know. And it goes it goes dead. Um, I don't really know what Andy's plan is here. Is he plan to just go? He All he knows is that, like, the woman is from Mount Pilot. But that's probably a fucking lie. Yeah. Uh, she and just, what, and she what, sold you an obvious lemon. Of course she doesn't fucking live where she thinks she said she lives. And And why did you take the shitty car? Why didn't you take the police car? Yeah. If you were planning to arrest a person. Like, do, and, but what was their plan? They're just, like, stand in the middle of the town and be like, All right, Lesh, you come on out! <laughs> Anybody seen an old lady in this town? Uh, do, send me all the old ladies. Line them up. <laughs> I'm the law. So Andy calls Gomer, uh, and then he and Barney sit in the back seat, uh, waiting for the tow truck. And then they fall asleep. And a tow truck comes and it tows them away, but it's not Gomer. It's Lesh it's Mr. Lesh. It's Mrs. Lesh. But it's not her. It's her like accomplice. Uh, who, who is younger man. the guy? He's it's, the it's, guy that's been on the show like fifteen fucking times. Yeah. The guy that looks like a mean thumb. Yeah, the, uh, the mean thumb, his name is Alan Melvin. This is the fourth time we've seen him in multiple roles on the show. Uh he was Best Western Hotel Detective. Uh yeah. he was one of the mean farmers that bullied Barney. Uh he's been a gangster three times on this fucking show yeah yeah they just keep loving and you know what this guy rules like he's great he's a grade a asshole actor every time he shows up i'm like hell yeah this guy yeah Uh, but also again watching this all at once you're like come on you could have given these roles to literally anyone else he picks up their car and he tows it back and he's like hey check it out check it out old lady that runs this chop shop look what i found and she's like, you goddamn idiot. That's the one we sold to that idiot in Mayberry. By the way, and remember, Barney and Andy are asleep in the back seat for this. They wake up and they go, what the hell is going on? Which I have to say, I adore this because once again, the Mayberry Police Department does not solve a crime. No, <laughs> <laughs> they stumble ass backwards. Like, basically, the job is completely done for them. Be like. Like, oh, Ma, I accidentally got my hand stuck in these handcuffs. Oh, no, I put them on you, too. Oh, I've called 911 by stepping on the phone. Oh, no. (laughs) It's so good. Like, I love this. I love how inept they are. They just have, they Coen brother their way into solving this crime. They took a fucking nap. They jump out of the car with their guns around, and then the mom is like, I'll give you a free a free lemon car. And Barney's like, oh, I'll take that bribe. Can I take that bribe? And Andy's like, no, don't take a fucking bribe. And he's like, right, yeah, no bribes. Uh, and then they're done. Uh, here is your stinger. 
Um, Barney now has his $300 back. And he thinks he's going to buy another car. And another old lady shows up at the courthouse. Uh, and Barney's immediately suspicious. And she says, like, uh, I only drove this to the church on Sundays. My my nephew is a minister at the church, so I just went there. And Barney, that's when Barney's like, all right, shut up. Who are you working with? Shut the fuck up. You're clearly running a scam on me. And screams at her. Uh, and then the end of this is that the nephew opens the door and says, hello, Aunt Ruth or whatever. Have you have you found a buyer for the car? And we're supposed to be like, ah, ha, ha, that proves that Barney's overreacting. That doesn't prove shit. Yeah. That proves nothing. The other old lady who was running a scam also had a younger accomplice. All of this proves is that de- this, if this one was a scam, they just bought a, a collar. Yeah. You can just buy ministers' collars. And also, like, they're like, haha, Barney's paranoid now. It's like, no, no, no. To take Barney's side, he just got scammed out of $300, like, yesterday. Yeah. Of course he's very jumpy. Yeah. The- it's traumatizing. If I was, if I was conned out of an entire fucking car purchase, I would probably never buy a car again. This stinger bit makes no sense. This stinger bit asks us to not be on Barney's side when we should be 100% on Barney's side. Yeah. Like, uh, and that's it. That, that's, that's an episode. Da, 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 da. Episode. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Cloud right through Andy, that one. Andy meter. Uh, seven. I don't know. Whatever. Nine. I liked it. It's funny. Like, I, I get why Andy Griffith himself liked this episode. It, it's good. It's a fine half hour of television. Uh, Barney meter. Pff, I don't nothing. Know, nothing. No, nothing. Nothing yeah. upsets. Yeah, whatever. Get Zero. out of here. Go away. Whatever. Um, Stop bothering us. <laughs> That's it for this episode of, of Breaking Mayberry. As always on the internet, you can get at us on Twitter. We're at Break Mayberry on Facebook.com slash Breaking Mayberry. Patreon.com slash Breaking Mayberry. We have an Instagram. I don't use it. It's it's Breaking Mayberry. And follow it. That wouldn't it be weird if you just followed us on Instagram, a thing we don't use. And uh, on Twitter, I'm at Schneid Remarks. It's S-C-H-N-E-I-D Remarks. I'm at the Luds, two Ds. The music you heard at the beginning was by Max Ludwig, but we are not going to play Max Ludwig at the end. Instead, we are going to play Dinner Bells by Wolf Parade, a favorite of our friend Nathan uh, in his, in tribute to him. Uh, and that's pretty much it for us. Uh, always don't forget to like and subscribe and give us ratings and reviews to help us get in the earbuds of others. And uh, be safe, everyone. Take care. We'll see you all down at the fishing hole.